they also feel very comfortable and not get very tired, worried, or exhausted with this disease and the lockdown. So let's come to the first question. And I think I should first thank all the participants as well for joining in and spending an hour's time here with us. Uh, really to differentiate between the common cold and cough, or so to say the common flu and COVID-19, it's very difficult. That's where the challenge is. Because the common cold usually occurs in children, especially when they go to school, they pick up the cold from other friends, gets into a cough, and if they have a history of, say, wheezing or allergy, then they get worse on their cough, and they may develop fever. So that's the natural course, which is not there at the moment because children are not going to school, they are at home, they are in a closed environment, and uh, the incidence of these coughs and colds are much less. So in today's environment, if a child or we'll include even parents and adults for that purpose, if they develop a cough and cold, you know, all of us become quite scary to begin with. We should not, because it could be one of the other viruses, the non-COVID virus that's probably playing up. And most of the time, the period that it affects us is about four days or so, plus minus one day, and it goes away. But if one of us or our kids were to have a cough and cold and plus minus fever, the first thing we should do is at home itself, just try to isolate that individual and don't make them worried, don't make them scared, don't unduly worry yourself and you should give them paracetamol. And if you feel things are not looking right, I think at the outset your pediatrician or you'll say your physician if it's an adult, uh, who is unwell, should be informed and one should maintain that link from that stage. More often than not, this cough and cold will go away in four days time and then we are home. There's no issue at all. And the only medication that may, medication that may be required would be paracetamol, which is calpol or crocin, whatever you've been using. And uh, try not to use any cough medications unless specifically you or your child have been using inhalers for cough, that could be continued. Because if we did use something else on our own, like an antibiotic, we may be masking the symptoms of COVID. And the reason why I'm saying we should be in touch with our physician is that supposing in three days time, things did not go the way we wanted, then at least we have got a point of contact. And from that point of contact, we can take it forwards, which we'll come to later in the talk. So at this point of time, more often than not, if somebody were to have cough, cold, plus minus fever, we should not worry. We should try and keep them in one room. And if one of our parents had it who are staying with us or elderly grandparents, we should do the same to them. Give them food, keep them happy, uh, but try to isolate them at home itself. Understood. And um, any other symptoms which you would point out? Because some yeah. friends have kids. asked uh, specifically about the symptoms in kids. Yeah. So kids and adults, when they do get go towards COVID, then the cough tends to be more continuous, more persistent, and they may have a... Uh, change of taste you can say or a change of smell you know these two functions may be hampered and the fever may be there which is 102 or so and there may or may not be breathing issues i think just if we are heading towards that stage we should be in touch with our physician because we may need to do a test for covid so that that will give us a lot of assurance now, just to stay on that, up till now, most of the cities and most of the places in India, they had a, a plan that a patient has to be admitted to a hospital mm -hmm. to, to undergo this test. Uh, but now, the situation, if I can tell you in Calcutta, is that you need not be admitted 
you can go to a hospital outpatient department straight away yourself without a physician's note and they will do the test which is a nasal swab and you get the results within 24 hours and it's very reassuring if it's negative because this test is practically 99.5% specific and it gives the correct results. Sometimes one may have symptoms of COVID and one may fall in that 0.5% and that individual may need a repeat test after two or three days. So what I'm trying to say is that our physician should always be in the loop so that we know which is the path to treatment in case hospitalization is required. But more often than not, more than 95% of the ch uh, cases and the times the child or ourselves will get better. But it's important to know the path of, uh, to, to follow in case it's not. Okay, so I think you've answered one of the questions when you say that most of the time hospitalization is not required, but uh, uh, there were two questions and I'll ask that to you together just so that if there's anything else you would like to point out to our attendees, what is the procedure for getting yourself tested? And here we are looking at children and in what circumstance is the hospitalization required? So if we are talking about children, I think it's important that our pediatrician is informed the day there is fever or cough on telephone itself. There's no need for him to see and there's no need for us to go to him. So as long as things are on record and the pediatrician is aware and in three days time, if we are all right, then it's okay. And if it's otherwise and the temperature gets worse, the cough is bad, then the pediatrician will probably like to see that can be arranged and we have to be very careful that we do not go to a busy hospital setup. We try and see the pediatrician in the clinic where social distancing and all the care that should be taken in this given time are followed. Uh, sometimes it's better that we can have a consultation on telephone or telemedicine, what it's called. A discussion so that the physician or the pediatrician can see the child for himself on a video call and assess whether we should be worried, whether we should be looking at doing tests for COVID, whether we should be looking at a possible hospitalization. It may not be 100%, but it would be quite useful for the physician, for the pediatrician to make that uh, estimation. So some parents have actually um, written in saying that there is a concern to visit a hospital or clinic, uh, you know, let alone a stepping out. And it's difficult to keep the precautions, take the steps uh, as simple as, you know, young baby or a young kid having a mask yeah. on. Um, and and, and, and the, 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 the ailment may be very different. It may just be a tummy ache or a ear pain. So uh, what should be done in uh, that circumstance? So once we have assessed that uh, say a child has got either fever, cough and cold, where we are worried about COVID, or he's got a tummy ache where we are worried that it's not appendicitis, or it's not one of the other issues which requires immediate medical attention, I think these can be fairly clearly and quite easily done on the telephone itself with telemedicine. So Sometimes our physicians or our pediatricians or our practitioners, they are not used to this. So we can help them to become used to it because it's fairly straightforward. I mean, just if I can take a minute here, uh, some physicians will say, no, I to computer say, ye nahi kar sakta So, you know, we can give them a lead and say that is very straightforward. You know, the easiest way to do is a WhatsApp call and you change it to a video and the entire discussion that goes on is encrypted. It can be tracked and the person uh, can discuss all the problems that they have. And I've had issues in the last one week where there was a concern about the testes getting torsion because the mother sent a picture saying that my son has got pain in the testicles and it looks a little red to me. So that's an acute medical emergency. But on seeing him on the video, he was perfectly all right. So he need not have gone to the hospital. Otherwise, 
he required an immediate hospitalization. Another child with constipation, you know, uh, parents knew that he has constipation, but the pain was such because of the lockdown, they thought it could be appendicitis, but on the telephone itself, you know, asking the mother to press on different sides of the child's tummy, we could assess that it is not appendicitis. So there we are, we prevented a child going to a doctor or to a hospital where potentially they can get infected even sometimes. So that's, that's a very useful. So uh, uh, I was actually uh, keeping this for the last doctor, but maybe mm -hmm. you, could, uh, you could tell us a little bit about uh, uh, how you are doing your online consultancy. Uh, so for, that, for, for, for parents for parents yeah so there are quite a few ways of doing it one is the straightforward way is to you know register with one of these uh, ptms or any of those agencies and uh, immediately after registering you can make a video call you don't need a different mobile number there is something called a uh, business uh, what is called business ptm yeah or there is another group that you can take, it's called Lyrate, L-Y-G-R-A-T-E. So one can join any of these, it's got to be from the physician's end, and the physician has to take a lead. So, you know, we as patients can give a lead to our physicians. I know there's a doctor called Dr. Indu Koshla from Mumbai, she is a pediatrician, and she does in normal times also a lot of telemedicine, which she finds is very convenient. So we have to ensure that our pediatrician with whom we are comfortable is able to do telemedicine so that we can tide over this difficult situation. Thank you very much. So I guess the attendees and parents will need to go back to their respective pediatrician and, 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 and their chamber and ask if this facility is available. Moving on, um, and this is a question which I see on a chat box as well. Uh, we had listed it down. Uh, so, so there are a lot of young kids and we've been in lockdown for over six weeks now uh, mm. with some vaccinations being due. So what yes. is your advice to parents to up to, you know, should they step out or can they wait and how long can they wait after the due date has passed? So I would say in a place like Mumbai, best is not to step out. Yeah, uh, children who are less than six months, they have some vaccinations which are time bound. One of them is called rotavirus. It doesn't matter if the child or the infant does not take that vaccine, but it may be very difficult if he goes to a clinic, he or she, and in the clinic we contract something which we did not like and we, did, we would like not to. So I would say delaying the vaccination is no issue at all, although you will hear from World Health Organization, Indian Academy of Pediatrics, and many of the pharma companies that don't delay the vaccination. There can be an outbreak of measles. Theoretically, yes, but practically, I don't think that's going to happen. But if we were to go to a busy pediatrician's clinic who's got some children sitting with fever and some for vaccination, that's terrible. Even if, he, if the pediatrician had an exclusive vaccination session, I would possibly think about it and do the important ones first. In those important ones, it would be the DPT, the measles, the MMR, the chickenpox, and the flu vaccine. So the hepatitis A, the hepatitis B, the typhoid, uh, HPV, which is the cervical cancer vaccine in girls, all these can wait. If we do get an opening, a chance with a pediatrician, these initial vaccinations for a kid less than eight months should be done. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to pick up a few questions from the chat box at this point because they are related to the first lot of questions that we have discussed. And there are some very young parents uh, asking this question. Uh, and I know that uh, this is a newborn, uh, a may mayborn baby. Uh, are there any specific signs when it comes to a newborn uh, with respect to COVID because they are so small and this is a first time parent. Yeah, congratulations for the parents who are just uh, parents of a 10 day old. Really, we should not worry and should not panic, but just make sure that people who come into the room are exclusively parents and no outsider, including help, like the traditional Dayu who comes in. All those people should not be allowed. 
if the baby is fine and the mother is fine, which I'm sure the case is, uh, breastfeeding should be done freely and there should be no concerns. The reason to worry would be if mother developed fever, then we need to test and then we need to test the baby. Otherwise, we need to do nothing at all. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask one more outside of the questions which we've listed. Hmm. Uh, what precaution should parents take while isolating uh, the child? Yeah, so that's, that's very important. <coughs> Excuse me. So I think if it's a five-year-old child, say, you can't tell the child to be isolated in one room. So one of the parents have to go with the child. And, uh, uh, so, and you can't maintain social distancing. So a mask is important. And if it's a five-year-old child, you can have a homemade double-layered cloth, you know, which looks like a mask and which is like a mask. And that's the best, really. No need for a surgical mask. No need for an N95. They are all meant for other purposes. A simple cloth mask. And if the child can put it on, it's fine. If not, still it's fine. But the mother should use, or whoever one parent is with the child, should use a mask. Um, I'm actually going to take one more from the chat box because it's related to what we just discussed. And yeah. the, uh, attendees, uh, confidentiality is maintained, so feel free to ask whatever you want to ask on the chat box. Yeah. And if you want yeah. to ask openly, uh, then yeah. at the end. So um, yeah. uh, this parent's daughter has uh, uh, has taken the first of the three injections for vaccination against cervica, cervical cancer. Uh, yeah. The next one is due now. Mm -hmm. um, is it okay that the parent does not take the child for the next shot right away? Or, or will, will the parent have to start the dose all over again? Yeah. So can I just ask one thing? How old is the child? Okay, so uh, we'll come back to that question. And uh, yeah. the person who has posed it, if you don't mind asking, um, 19. Now, is that 19 months or 19 uh, years? I'm sorry. Must be, uh, must be 19 years. 19 years, that's right, yeah. No, there's no need to go for the vaccination and three are good enough, there's no need for another one. Okay, so I hope that answers your question, parent. Uh, we'll come back to you if there's something else. Now, uh, let's go back to our list of questions. Um, some, some, some thoughts about good practices at home, what precautions uh, should we generally take uh, yeah. other than the usual? And yeah. uh, specifically with respect to a kid's point of view, uh, yeah, I know one parent mentioned about hygiene and yeah. uh, what are the high habits and hygienic ones that kids should adopt. Uh, yeah. Linked linked to that, you know, fruits and veggies which are coming uh, into yeah. the house, whether a cleaning agent should be used, uh, mm -hmm. home delivery of food, um, how good, how bad, what your thoughts are. So if we can club these two or three and ask you. The sure, next. sure. So first of all, let's take the second question. Uh, vegetables and fruits that come in should be clean and I think one of the best and simple methods to clean it is potassium permanganate which even today in a lockdown situation you'll get it in any pharmacy. It's a simple purple colored stuff and leave the fruit and vegetables for half an hour and they are reasonably clean from pesticides and possible COVID virus as well. Uh, in good practice at home, make kids a part of the day's planning, I would say, whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner. That makes them feel that they are a part of the decision making. And in the long term, probably their craving for junk food, pizzas, and all will also go down if they feel that they are a part of what's being made at home and they have been incorporated into decision making. Empathy is something that I would say is a very good practice at home that our children should be taught. And this is the time when both parents are home. And I think parents should first understand what is empathy and if they can make their kids not say that you should be empathetic, but to you know, produce a situation where they understand what empathy is. And we should stop giving too much advice to them. And what I feel is, that uh, TV time or kids, if they are on the TV or if they are on the mobile, that should be stopped at least during meal times. And if they are going to stop it, parents have to stop it as well. That's a good time to start these good habits. Kids would see the suffering that's there all over the world with children and adults. 
with the COVID. So they should be made to feel about it. We should not hide any facts from them. We should tell them really what's happening and telling them should be in a reassuring tone that it's all going to get better. But this happens because this pandemic is something that we probably are seeing it and maybe we will not see and hopefully our children will not see it again. So they should really try and understand for their future as to what it is so that once they see the suffering all around, the issue of helping people come in their mind, you see, and that's very important to inculcate that habit of helping others. Even another point that would uh, come into force at this point would be value for money. You know, children should understand what money means. So I think on this, uh, probably uh, I've answered most of the points that you've raised on this. Yeah. Um, so we're also looking at the lockdown being relaxed in some way. Yeah. And since there are parents from different cities which have logged in uh, mm. today, uh, what would your guidance be with respect to kids uh, starting to step out? Uh, I mean, they're not going to step out uh, for fun, but in case mm -hmm. they uh, need to step out, need to step out. What sort of uh, precautions need to be taken? Yeah, we need to be very careful, really, when the lockdown is relaxed. As far as children go out, you must have seen in Spain, they were all jumping around and they were allowed to go out freely. But uh, I think really it should be in a very graduated way. But at any point of time, parks, you know, shopping malls should not be the place where kids are uh, allowed to go. And I would say that at the same time, our child needs social freedom. So we may have given them lots of it at home, but when the lockdown is withdrawn, they should be allowed to go out, but it should be for a timed period, maybe 30 minutes, 60 minutes under parental control. That's what I would say is the ideal, but all countries are having different issues to it and nobody knows what is the right way out. Like for example, in the UK, the less than five year olds are going to start school from 1st of June. So whether it's right or wrong is debatable. Um, something as simple as what mask should we be wearing, both adults and kids, uh, any yeah. guidance there? Yes, I think really a cloth mask for the community, for all of us, is the best mask, which can be made at home. One can buy it also. And it just has two layers of cloth and it can be washed every day. That simple face mask is the best for us in the community. The next step is a surgical mask, the blue colored one, which people use. That's good for doctors when they are in the OPD seeing many patients. That's very protective. And the last one is the N95, which we find people all over the city are having it. And there is a vent, uh, there is a vent to it as well. These are masks that should be used as a part of PPE. So it's a misuse that we are doing. So maybe people who need it are unable to get because the wrong people are using it. So it's very simple. In the community, we need a face mask. For doctors in the OPD is the surgical mask. And the N95 is only for situations where what's called aerosol, aerosol generating procedures are done. Like somebody is taking a nebulizer, somebody is doing surgery, you know, where there's drilling going on. That's the place where an N95 is. Thank you. So parents, please keep that in mind and spread the word. Leave the N95 for where it is needed and stick to cloth mask and if at all surgical masks. Uh, you mentioned about uh, phones and iPads. Uh, there was a concern and it's a concern in our household as well. Uh, a lot of children have moved to virtual school or a home school over uh, the, the Microsoft Teams platform and other platforms. Uh, some kids are spending two hours, some kids are spending the whole day in front of iPad. Uh, in some cases, they have assignments after school. So effectively, the screen time has shot up significantly. Um, and there's a concern at, at the how in, in every household. So yes. what, what and how should we adopt uh, to this new normal? Yeah, so this is very challenging and I'm happy that most of our children have accepted it. And there's a research, simultaneous research going on 
where they have realized that a child is able to learn better and faster this way than the traditional school teaching. So with this sort of information, this bit of information, whether in future schools are going to adopt this as a modality of studies, I don't know. But if they do, I think we parents should be involved in the decision making. That's very important. Secondly, if the school has, say, three hours, uh, the child is on the, uh, on the iPad or the computer, they should not be giving homework to the child, which was happening, I think, sometime before. But when the parents spoke to the teachers, they tried to complete all the work in those three hours. And some schools have taken it in bits and pieces, like one hour, a gap of half an hour, and then the rest of uh, two hours so that the child gets rest and all the homework is completed. But the number of hours total that the child spends, that's OK. It should not be eating time and meal times at that time, which it won't be, of course. So one of our attendees uh, is asking whether, uh, just in case, in, in case the schools open, uh, what would your advice be? Do we send, send the kid to school um, or wait for some more time? Wait for how long? Does it have to wait till a vaccine comes out? What is it? What is happening in other countries? And since you're so well networked, uh, some some very broad thoughts there, doctor. Yeah. So that's really very difficult to answer because the schools are going to be equally concerned when they do put up a date that they are going to start as we parents are. So the schools are going to be concerned. And the last thing they want is that in a community like a school where children, 30 students are sitting in a classroom, that one of them is coughing and unfortunately spreads something that we don't want. So the schools should be very careful. As of today, to answer that question is difficult, but I know all parents, if say a school is opening on a first of say a particular month, the parent will say, I'll send my child a month after that or two weeks after that. So all that is going to come in. Best would be that once the disease progression is known in the community and we know we are heading towards a uh, peaking of the curve and going down, then the school should discuss with we parents and come to a very firm date, which is very sensible, acceptable. And as I said, whether they're going to make it only three days school and two days of teaching uh, online, that's something that's to be seen in future. This is going to be global, not just in our country. But they have been picking up some cues there. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the questions which has been asked, um, you know, in, in times of social distancing, um, how do we stay away from rich food and the refrigerator? Uh, so many of us are cooped up at home. The kids do not have their physical activity. Uh, they don't have their time to go down to play exercise. So what would your guidance be? How much is needed and what can be done in the circumstances? Yeah. So I think we all know that we should be eating healthy. We should be doing exercises. We should be not eating the wrong food. The best is really to get a child, if he's five, six years old, to contribute to the day's plan of what should be had for breakfast, for lunch. And then he will never sulk away. He will never be near the fridge then. Whereas if parents impose you know, what should be had at lunch and breakfast, then it may. So I think that's one way to get over it. They should be doing graded exercises, physical activity. We should be playing some indoor games with them along with parents so that, you know, they feel that they are very wanted and that they are being attended to in the appropriate way. At bedtime, we should be reading some stories which they like so that they have good sleep. We have to understand you know, a kid probably understands perhaps a bit more than what we think they are understanding. So what the fear that we have, kids have in equal amount, sometimes a bit more. So we have to be very understanding towards that, not to give too much of advice, not to tell them, don't eat this, don't eat this. Make them a part of what's going to happen tomorrow or today in the morning. And if they have been factored in, then they'll probably not resent. And I'm assuming that advice is for the fathers as well, not just the Absol mothers. Absolutely, absolutely. And to spend more time in the kitchen helping the mothers. Uh, that message is loud and clear. 
Yes. Um, so we've been talking uh, in office and uh, around around uh, our friend circle about mental health, anxiety, depression. Uh, but we have always talked that, talked in the context of adults. Um, is this a subject which is relevant to kids? And what should be uh, the concern, or where should we, where, where, where should the parent get um, uh, worried and, and 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 call you up? Mm. It's very important because these issues are arising a lot in young kids and adolescents, and of course in adults. So it's I would say it's very important to reassure children, listen to their concerns, and answer their queries relating to the outbreak. Don't hush up. Spend quality time with them and give them the attention they seek. Yeah, it's important that whatever attention they are seeking, they should be addressed appropriately. It's very normal for a child to be anxious and look out for emotional cues. And once you find that the child is emotionally upset, you know, you can reassure them. You can talk to them. You can hold them tight. Avoid being judgmental when they express their feelings. That's very important. You know, if they express a feeling of something, and at that point of time, we need to be very sensitive. Don't avoid questions related to COVID. Be very frank about it. Reassure them that everything will be okay and we need to take care. That's the point where you can talk about precautions, proper eating, and try not to get irritated with kids. That's an advice to all parents. Engage kids in indoor activities to reduce their boredom and give them, say, puzzles to solve, is age appropriate, teach them craft, encourage them to pick up a hobby, involve them in stretching exercises or yoga, dance with them maybe, you know, and, <coughs> sorry. This is a good time to teach them to remain in contact with friends, encourage them to talk to their grandparents, cousins, loved ones, maybe a video call, this will help in understanding the value of relationship. So this lockdown, uh, you know, if you look at one aspect of it is bringing us to reality. You know, probably this was something that we were forgetting with the busy schedule we had. Give children very clear information, especially what's occurring across the world that I've already said, and give facts that are appropriate for them to understand. Avoid confusion that may cause anxiety. So you have to be very careful. Uh, you can explain issues through drawing a small picture or a drawing or a sketch. Uh, make learning something which is routine at home. But if they're not in a mood, give it up. Give small assignments to children, small assignments. We find parents have lots of knowledge. Sometimes they have less of that instinct. So that knowledge doesn't come to use be very careful. So if we feel we are in that group, maybe after the lockdown is over, we need to be counseled by someone later. And as we are all growing, you know, I tend to learn when I'm examining from candidates a lot. In the same way, I learned something from one of my grandkids and he very clearly identified the difference between needs and wants. You know, if you think over it later after we are finished, it's a very, very thin difference between needs and wants. So I would say that's the answer to that particular point that you have raised. Thank you. Um, I'll come back to the questions related to um, what we've discussed from the chat box, but let's go back to our list of questions and move to diet, immunity building and yeah. medicines. A um, lot of questions around uh, what the diet of kids um, are there any special foods that that help build immunity and whether there are any extra medicines um, such as vitamins to be given and linked to that um, since sunlight plays such an important role in our lives is it uh, is it required to supplement the loss of sunlight in any manner and of course keep in mind uh, there are kids of different uh, uh, the varied age here so what what would your thoughts be doctor yeah. So in the vitamins, I think vitamin D and vitamin C, these are the two vitamins that has a positive role 
I think it's in overall building up the immunity rather than preventing COVID by any means. I would say traditional foods, the dietitian will sometimes call it superfoods, but just call them foods, you know, and uh, the dietitian will say a small amount of ghee is appropriate. But I think it should be a combination of carbohydrate, protein and fat in the right proportion with minerals and vitamins in the natural form. Uh, like, you know, in India, all the different berries that we get, sometimes we tend to look for berries that we get from abroad, cranberries, rather than the berries that we get here. All the berries are wonderful in providing us lots of rare vitamins and minerals, which we need for our, uh, for our immunity. So I would say that this is an opportunity where children take a balanced diet, nothing in particular. If they are on vitamins for some reason, it's fine. They don't need to take extra vitamin C because it would come in the food. Vitamin D that you raised the question, if they have had a low vitamin D, it should be supplemented. But if there is a chance that the child or adults, family members can spend 20 minutes on the terrace, if there is one, in the sunlight between 9.30 in this weather and 3 o'clock or 2.30, I would say, 20 minutes, it gives you 400 international units of vitamin D, which is good for three days. Understood. And would, would, would there be um, certain medicines, common ones, which one should keep at home um, during an emergency situation uh, like we are in right now? Yeah. For that, I would say some people are regularly taking one medicine or the other, other, maybe for gastritis, maybe for their heart, maybe for some other reason. All those should be in abundant supply so that we don't have to rush out and it's over uh, suddenly and we realize that we don't have a supply for the next day. Apart from that, the usual medicines like for fever, pain, vomiting and tummy ache, these should be available which I'm sure every household has. At this point, I would say it's a good time to go back to your emergency kit, you know, the first aid box that you have and make sure that everything is in place there, like a piece of gauze, you know, a thermometer, a working thermometer. Mm -hmm. That's important. So check that uh, yeah, everything is in order. And for kids, there is something called steady strips, which many parents must have seen. If there is a cut or a brew, uh, a big sharp cut, or sometimes even a moderately deep cut, you know, you can just put it, it's like cello tape. So you don't have to go to a hospital where one is likely to be exposed to so many other issues and one can manage at home. But in all these circumstances, the most important thing is to remain calm and relaxed because you'll be able to do better and your child will also be more relaxed at that time. And, and doctor, your thoughts on uh, the flu vaccine, is it, is it something which is advised and required for kids and adults? Yes, the flu vaccine should be taken by one and all from six months onwards till 100 years of age. It's an annual vaccine. And the one that has just come or has been there for about three weeks now is the 2020 quadrivalent flu, which incorporates the southern hemisphere where we are. So that's the vaccine that one should be taking and one should be taking, taking it every year on a routine basis. Uh, the next vaccine, flu vaccine that we will be taking after this, maybe you never know, the coronavirus vaccine may be incorporated with it. It may be separate or we may not have a vaccine for the next one and a half years or we may not have it at all because we had SARS in 2003 and that's similar to a coronavirus and we were never able to get a vaccine for it because this is a mutated virus. And unfortunately, all the flu vaccines can only be made after that particular flu has occurred. Like if you remember in 2009, we had the swine flu. So the swine flu vaccine or the vaccine, the flu vaccine to include the swine flu was only after the swine flu occurred in 2009. So today's vaccine contains a swine flu. The reason for this is we cannot preempt or make a vaccine before the disease because the virus swifts and drips. That's the character of the virus. And this time, this virus, coronavirus, has mutated as well, apart from drifting and swifting. That's the reason why it's difficult to make a vaccine. Understood. I'm going to uh, go to a controversial subject. 
and uh, feel free to uh, not respond to it because uh, mm. um, uh, this is this is about homeopathy and ayurveda and mm -hmm. alternate therapies some mm -hmm. which is even being prescribed by our government and the ayush ministry and there yeah. have been specific questions about camphora and arsenic album yeah uh, uh, so you know can you rely on this can can this be a resort uh, again i know it's a bit of a controversy so you no, no. Yeah. can decide whether you want to answer or not yeah personally i feel since we have got nothing to offer for covid patients you know and many of the things that are there in the pipeline either being uh, sort of tested whether they are appropriate or not until then if somebody takes camphor that the homeopath suggests or somebody takes other things that ayush uh, is suggesting i would say there should be no harm but i was just seeing the list that you had sent it says ghee in the nostrils you know, these are things that can cause problems so one should be very careful of doing those but apart from that there is no harm because they are natural things but the homeopathic medicine i was just checking with a homeopath friend here and uh, he said i'll respond in a few days i just checked with him yesterday about the camphor i know some industrialists like mr bajaj has been saying that he's given camphor to all his employees and to people whom he comes across i would say there is no harm but i am not a homeopath so i would not understand how it works but uh, i think it's an individual decision so we'll leave it at that and we'll just tell people not to do any self medication even if you are taking this uh, please ask a, a homeopath or a person who pres prescribes ayurveda um, lovely i think uh, we are doing very well on time i see uh, we are 15 minutes away Mm -hmm. uh, just one last uh, uh, question uh, before we open it up and I start looking at the chat box. Uh, in case somebody in the family uh, shows mild symptoms or eventually contracts COVID, um, are there some specific protocols that we should follow in e each case, both yeah. mild symptoms and a positive case? Yeah. So there are two things to it, really. Before I come to how to go about it, you know, you will see that in all the unfortunate patients who have had COVID, they require oxygen when they are admitted to the hospital and when they are in intensive care. And we have seen uniformly that the saturation in the blood, that's the first thing to go down. So what is saturation of the blood? It's called the SAPO2. So this is a meter. It's a very small handy meter, a little bit different from the thermometer. If, if, if you can bring it to the center of the screen, please. We can't see. Yeah. Slightly higher. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And I'll show you from all the sides. And I'll just check my PO2. So if you could do it slightly. Um... Yeah. Yeah. So I've just switched it on. Slightly higher. And maybe if you can go back a bit. Oh, yeah. Perfect. It's perfect. And this is available uh, everywhere. Yeah, sorry, just one minute. No, you, you could not see. That's the reading. It's 99. Yeah. yeah. That's the saturation. And below it is the pulse 78. I don't say that we need to keep this at home. But many of us would have seen when you have visited your doctor that after examining you, they just check your SpO2. What's been seen is that in COVID patients, the first thing that happens is there's a fall of this SpO2. It should be normally above 95, 94. If somebody has in the 80s, that means there is something wrong. And with a cough and some symptoms like COVID, one should really get uh, prepared to head for the hospital. That's the reason why I showed this. It doesn't mean that we should be keeping it in our first state, not at all but something that we should all know about it. Now, the question is that we should all have a path to seeing our doctor and to, to go to the hospital if need be. That path must be very clear in our mind. And every city and every state has a different protocol and is changing. Like in West Bengal, uh, up till about three weeks ago, you could not do a COVID test you had to go through a hospital. In the initial stage, you had to be an admitted patient. Then only you could undergo that test. 
but the latest is for the last about nine days now, we can go to a hospital outpatient department, ask for a test and it will be done. And within 24 hours, you get the report, no question of admitting. So this is the COVID test, which is for the disease and it's called the uh, PCR test, polymerase chain, chain reaction test. And uh, it has a reverse transcriptase. So RT-PCR it's called. That's the test that you see on the television. People are driving and somebody is poking into their nose and taking a swab. That's the test where you pick up the virus and it's 99.5% specific and sensitive. So if somebody has a positive result on that test, he has got COVID. A negative one needs to be again done if the symptoms persist. And just while we are on the test, let's come to the other test, which you must be hearing about is called the serology test. That's the test that's done from the blood, from the vein out here. A sample of blood is taken as we do a normal blood test and they look for antibodies. What are antibodies? So when we get dengue or we get any infection, what comes into our body is called the antigen. That's the enemy you can say. And our body prepares a protection against it, the defense department, that's the antibody. So the serum test, the serology test that we do on the blood test, and if we find somebody has got antibodies, it means that this individual at some stage had COVID and he has recovered from it or he did not have symptoms, but he had mild COVID. But whether he is going to have this immunity for two weeks or for two years, nobody can say that as of now. But for many other diseases, we could say that. But COVID being special, we cannot say for how long that immunity would last. So this test is being utilized today in many countries to put people back to work. They are seeing that if their antibodies are present, that means their serology test is positive. That means they've got some sort of immunity so they can get back to work. They need not work from home. These are the two tests that are in vogue. Forget about the plasma because that's the therapy. And there are lots of other treatment modes for it. Okay. And in, ter in terms of uh, putting together some emergency protocol at home and being prepared, um, um, specifically with respect to COVID-19, and, and I know you have mentioned uh, to not panic several times. Uh, is there any other guidance which you would want to give to the attendees? And then we are going to uh, go to the um, yes. and open up. So I think every family, every family should have a written path to be followed. And that written, written path should be with the family doctor, or if you feel that, no, for my kids, family doctor is, I'm not very happy, is the pediatrician, then for, with the pediatrician, the path should be very clarified as to, doctor, if my child has fever, I'll be in touch with you on the phone. And if it gets worse, and if we are concerned about COVID, what are we supposed to do? Where can we see you or consult you or have a consultation on the telephone, uh, a video conferencing? so that we know what's to be done. And if a situation arose where he needs admission, we feel that he needs admission, which is the hospital and who are the contact person. I think those details should be not on the mobile only, it should be written down for both parents and other family members, which I've done for myself really. You know, I've spoken to and I keep upgrading it. And uh, I've got a list of three hospitals that if it's needed, that's where we go and these are the contact people. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll try and uh, share the protocol with everyone on the group and we'll WhatsApp it. So uh, stay on for a few days. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try and put together some uh, uh, something very quickly. Um, uh, thank you very much for You're answering welcome. all the questions. Uh, we are going to now quickly go through the chat box and if you give me a moment. Uh, yeah, the first one, um, if I may, and I'm going to quickly uh, finish the ones on chat box. And then if anyone wants to unmute themselves and want to ask the question, 
uh, please uh, mention in the chat box. Um, the flu vaccine, what was uh, the trade name uh, of it? Could you please repeat that for our attendees? Yeah, so it, there are two or three companies that make it. It's a quadruvalent. That means there are four antigens in it. And one of them is called the Influvac. So it's a quadrivalent vaccine, 2020, which is the year. And it's a Southern Hemisphere. It's called SH, Southern Hemisphere. That's the latest vaccine that has come in the month of January. Nothing to do with COVID, because COVID vaccine, as, you all, as we all know, is not there yet. But that's the latest vaccine that one should be taking. Okay, and um, I, I'm, I'm guessing you'll have to go to a pediatric um, uh, a clinic or a pediatrician for, for taking this vaccine. Absolutely, absolutely. But let me add one thing. The way things are, I don't think any of us should venture for a vaccine to go out to a hospital or to our doctor's clinic. I don't think we should. Okay, so that because, answers, that answers yeah. the next question because that is one more thing which uh, somebody has asked. Because we need to weigh the advantages and the risks involved in going and the risks are far more than the advantage, so we should not. Okay, thank you. Um, just give me a moment. Uh, vitamin D in the form of Arkitol Nano, oral liquid form for kids, would that help once a week? Yes, perfect. That's there perfect. You. Thank you. Um, sorry, give me a moment. Uh, I'm going to skip uh, some of them, which they're poking fun at me. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've talked about kids' eyes due to excess screen time, uh, but any preventive measure, uh, just to repeat uh, yourself, that can yeah, be yeah. taken? Sure, I think we didn't dwell on that. Uh, just apart from the eyes, I think it's the shoulder, the back, the posture. So we should ensure that the kid does get up after 20 minutes or 30 minutes, uh, not uh, the school timings, because that he can't, I suppose. And uh, they should be made aware that uh, eye strain can occur and their posture has to be correct so that their spine and shoulders are in the uh, right position. Okay, so just to repeat myself, if any one of you would like to ask the question on your own, uh, mention it in the chat box and I will unmute you. Uh, the next question, dosage of vitamin C for kids and adults. I think the question is, what's the dosage for vitamin? Yeah, yeah. it comes as a 500 milligram tablet and uh, kids would love to have the chewable one. It's called LIMC, L-I-M-C-E-E or chew -C, but you won't get it in the market. <laughs> it's all out of stock at the moment. You don't need really, if you were to use lemon and mosambi at home, it's good enough. And Aula, if you get, good enough. Okay. Um, so I'm going to ask this question um, since there's some doubt. Um, perhaps maybe I didn't ask it properly. Uh, it's about the cervical cancer vaccine. And the kid has taken one dose out of three. Second is due in May. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, right. Uh, Can I answer that? Yeah, please. So uh, the one that she has taken, it looks like that she has taken it in March then because the next one was due in May. She need not worry at all. Even if she takes it three months later, the first one would be valid and she'll take the second one. And since she's 19, she'll need three. So she'll take one after the COVID is well over, maybe in the next three months. And the third one she'll take four months after that. Okay. Um, what about children stepping out to play, uh, keeping social distance uh, in mind, wearing a mask and taking precaution? How much, how, how, how do you advise? Uh, what I see, the situation in Maharashtra and in Mumbai, I would not say that that is safe really, not as of today. All right. Um, somebody has a small baby, six months old. Should parents start going to work? One of them, both of them, what is uh, advisable? Right. That's very, very difficult. And, you know, we are coming to real difficult issues now. So both parents are working and this is a six month old and obviously is going to be cared by grandparents or by health. Yeah. So when the parents come back from work, how are they going to ensure that they have not carried something from workplace 
to the little kid and to the family. But yet they have to go back to work. So when they go back to work, that's a very difficult question really and difficult to answer. So I would say in this situation, I would ensure that if it's possible to do work from home, it should be done in this acute stage of the corona spread. What about Chavan Prash? Is that useful for immunity building? Uh, I have no idea, but I'm sure it would do no harm apart from making the child put on weight. And uh, perhaps we'll have to go to Nupur maybe for, for her teeth, which uh, there, there may be issues with too much of Chavan Prash. Okay. Um, what should be the line of treatment for G6PD patients as they are not permitted to take hydrochlorine? Yeah. So G6PD, for the benefit of others, is an enzyme that all of us we have. And it's inherited in a family on a basis called the X-linked. So six linked is the mode of transmission. In other words, if a family member has it, there's a chance that this will be passed on to their children. And generally boys are affected. And uh, when they are born, we can find out whether they are deficient in G6PD. G6PD is an enzyme. Now the good thing or the bad thing about it is that if somebody has G6PD and doesn't need to take any medications, he's fine throughout life, nothing happens. If supposing an individual doesn't know that he or she is G6PD deficient, gets malaria and gets the treatment for malaria, they can land up with another problem where the hemoglobin can go down to two because the blood gets hemolyzed and they are in acute shock and a terrible state apart from malaria. In other words, their blood gets hemolyzed because of the deficiency of G6PD. So I think it's important. And these days, just if I can say that all children, when they are discharged from hospital, newborn babies, they have a G6PD test. At least I do it. And it's written on their file. And I have at least uh, 25 children whom I can straight away put, who attend my clinic, who are G6PD deficient. And it's written on their file in big capital red letters that they are G6PD. And all the time, apart from malaria medicine, there are lots of other things that should be avoided, other medication. And one of them is phenoptilin. You know, those small little white balls that we keep in clothes? Accidentally, if a child were to swallow it, nothing much would happen. But if a G6PD deficient child swallowed it, we would be in deep, deep, acute medical emergency. So it's important to know who is G6PD deficient. Okay, uh, this is a very specific question. My child is um, uh, a preemie, 29 weeker, who mm -hmm. in the NICU for six weeks and has premature lungs. Every mm -hmm. time that he coughs, there is a wheeze. Any way to differentiate that from the COVID cough? Well, uh, I would say that you should not worry on that account because you have a good cause to know that your premature child had premature lungs and had what's called highline membrane disease, HMD. And the cough is because of that. Uh, really, you would need somebody from outside to come and superimpose the COVID to produce a COVID cough, which is very unlikely to happen in a premature baby who is at home. But your concerns are correct. And the only way to know would be by a test. So if the character of the cough does not change from what it has been over the last two, three months, I would not worry. If the character of the cough changes, then we would look into it. Um, doctor, I know we have uh, exhausted the one hour. Uh, could we still ask sure. you more questions and keep you... Uh... Sure, by all means, yeah. Okay, thank you. It will be so, a pleasure. Thank you so much. There, there are a couple of parents who have who've asked about... Um, uh, braces. Uh, there are kids with braces and they need to visit the dentist because of uh, um, broken braces or broken wires. What would you what would your recommendation be about going to dentist and what what is that turning point where you say okay if it is this uh, these are the precautions? I would absolutely not take this question and leave it to Nupur and she's the best person to answer it. Okay, so um, please reach out to Nupur uh, and, and she, will, she will take this one. Uh, the next one, um, and this is, um, this is again a parent of, of uh, young kids. Um, uh, if a mother is tested positive 
for COVID or showing mild symptoms, can she still breastfeed the babies? I, I think you mentioned something, but if, if you could clarify this, please. She can continue breastfeeding the baby, even if she is COVID positive, definitely. She can breastfeed. Okay, so the answer is the, she can. Yeah. Yes. The first case we had in the UK, I was there, uh, was on the 10th of March, when in North Middlesex Hospital, this COVID positive mother, she delivered a baby who was COVID negative, and she went home with the baby absolutely fine. And we were going for the exam board meeting. And if you remember, even Vikram was telling you about that 36 weeker, uh, which was on that um, yeah, small video of his, uh, where the mother and the baby both went home at 36 weeks and they were COVID positive, both of them. So it's not an issue to breast. Just to give you context, Vikram is my brother in law who's uh, head of uh, pulmonary care in a New York hospital and he's right in the front line uh, with COVID patients. Um, I know your answer to this, but uh, a parent is asking uh, about uh, suspected cavities. Is it fine to wait or, 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 or to go to the dentist? I think they should wait. And while they are waiting, uh, they should take extra care to keep their uh, oral hygiene to the best possible. Uh, but the person who's asked this question, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to connect offline. Uh, Nupur um, is, is the dentist and uh, we can ask her what her thoughts are on it. Um, we are, I hope I have taken all the earlier questions. I'm going to jump to uh, the end. Uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. So there are some very specific technical, uh, not technical, but very, very specific fact-based question. I, I'm going to... Uh, 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 my apologies, I'm going to skip that. Yeah. But uh, my child is minor, minor uh, thalassemic. So can can he take hydrochlorine when needed? Yes, absolutely. They can take okay. hydroxychloroquine if needed. Yeah. Uh, you know, you still have to step out in COVID times for doing your grocery runs and um, important things. Uh, one or two key steps that you should take uh, care of uh, on return. So I think one should take a bath immediately, leave all the clothing and all the shoes, everything outside. And as little as possible, grocery shop, uh, sh shopping should be done. And if possible, it should be delivered at the gate. And I think the most dangerous thing that I see is happening all around in Gujarat, in Maharashtra, in Bengal and all over the country is the vegetable shopping really. That's causing the problem because it passes through so many hands and so many levels uh, so we have to be very careful of that. Uh, and we've talked about masks. What about gloves? Are they recommended and what kind when we step out? It's not required really gloves. But uh, if you are doing a procedure, uh, like say if somebody is examining a patient, a doctor, or doing a vaccination, still gloves are not required. So why should one wear gloves really? I can't understand. I do see people really who are in the grocery shop, who are helping. Even those who have gone as customers are wearing gloves. I think the best is to keep the nails trimmed and uh, proper cleaning. And I would add one more thing here, really. Hand washing for 20 seconds. The best is, say, for example, if you are washing your hands, Nupur should be commenting later that, see, this was not perfect. Or if she's washing, you should be correcting her. That's very important. Because sometimes we tend to make it a little shortcut and we are not looking at all the details that should be. Hand washing is of prime importance to avoid COVID. And uh, taking hydrochlorine as a precautionary uh, measure, is that advisable? Not at all. Even for those people who are with patients of COVID, it's not yet recommended that they should be taking. Although the government of India has said they can take once a week, but uh, the most prominent physician of Mumbai, he also is not taking himself and he is not recommended so far. Uh, the flu vaccine, if, if there is a way, uh, if somebody can get it organized at home, uh, is that advisable to take? Um, any, any, any issue there? Yeah. Yeah. I think if there was somebody who could inject, family members can inject really. You can self-inject even. And if you were to procure it, you can take it. Uh, but okay. make sure that once it arrives home, it's left for uh, uh, that number of hours in the fridge 
and the outside container, you know, what you do with the other things, that care is taken and it can be done. Yes. Sure. Uh, the last question, um, I think we've taken up more, much more time than you had promised us. So um, no problem. Two, two questions in one. There are sleep issues with respect to kids. Any specific recommendation? And another one uh, about a child's appetite. It seems to have gone down maybe maybe because lack of exercise uh, and a sedentary life. Um, any Anything to boost this? The, yeah. the, the sleep and exercise too in one. Yeah. So the second child who has lost the appetite, I hope he's not becoming obese and he's not being overfed. And parents sometimes feel that, oh, he's got no appetite, whereas he's been eating more than what he should be. So that's a very important point to be first looked at. And the first question about sleep, I think there could be various reasons. Maybe the child is sleeping during the daytime more than what he, should, he or she should be sleeping. And at night, it's uh, much difficult for the child to uh, go off to sleep. So, or the child is on the television or one of the media, you know, for longer, or there is some disturbance in the environment that's causing, or if the child is 100% well or not, that should be ensured. So, and sleep time should be very pleasant time. Maybe in this hot weather, they should be given a bath and uh, one of the parents should be reading a small story, which they like, not what the parents like, what the kid likes. That can help. Um, that's that's absolutely fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not able to take uh, any more questions. We have extended uh, doctor's time that he had given to us. Uh, I'm going to hand this very quickly to uh, our one of our attendees, Tarulika Khaitan, to propose a vote of thanks. Uh, Tarulika, over to you. Thanks, Ravindra. Hello, Tarulika. Hello, how are you? How are you? Very well. First class. Thank you very much. So, so nice to see you. you. Yes, so nice to see you also. So thank, thank you. you so much for this fabulous session. It's Absolutely been a pleasure. Fabulous. And uh, I think, you know, one of the most difficult things during COVID is information. You know, the lack of information and Very also, true. you know, the uncertainty about the steps to take for our kids. So, you know, your uh, webinar has been full of information very enlightening and i'm sure it has benefited all a lot immensely so a uh, huge much. thank you to you and also to the doctor community uh, great thank you so much thank you so much for the nice words kind words thank you thank, thanks thanks uh, tarlika um, sorry we haven't been able to cover all the q and a's but uh, we'll try and uh, uh, see if there is something, if I can extract this file and uh, uh, post it on the group, if there is something which remains outstanding. Um, I will separately in a day or two share the protocol which uh, we promised. And uh, so stay on on the group for a few days and then you can exit. But um, thank you again, everyone, uh, attendees for joining in Sunday uh, evening. And uh, Dr. Agarwal, uh, that thank you thank you so much for your time it has been immense value and a huge learning uh, stay safe uh, everyone till we meet again bye so rabindra thank you very much and best wishes to everyone who's been participating this evening and take care and remain safe thank, thank you, you.